Hello, I'm Ovana Stark, State Director of Clean Water Action Minnesota. Clean Water Action works to ensure access to clean, swimmable, fishable, drinkable water, and I'm joined today by advocates fighting for a safer environment, lawmakers who have worked tirelessly to end PFAS exposure, and Minnesotans who have been exposed to the negative impacts of PFAS. A few months ago, we stood here and we were in awe of Amara Strandy, her family, and their story. They led us into their lives facing terminal cancer. Her family shared the reality of the pain of exposure to PFAS. Weeks later, we stood here again discussing the need to hear the PFAS bills in committee. And now we stand here in victory because the right thing was done. The legislators here today, as well as countless others, listened to the community and they did the right thing. We are thrilled that Governor Walls is addressing PFAS in his budget, that the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency is prioritizing this issue with their PFAS blueprint, and that the legislature prioritized taking swift and decisive action. Thank you to the lawmakers who have worked so hard for so long to end the non-essential use of PFAS. And thank you to the Strandy family for sharing their story so no one else has to suffer the way they have suffered. This language will protect workers, taxpayers, children, and families. I'll hand it off to the Strandy family. Thank you, my name is Michael Strandy. In January, we stood in this room together with a young woman whose body was being attacked by an insidious disease called fibrolamellar hepatocellular carcinoma. As you know, that young woman was my daughter. Amara Strandy. On that day, Amara gave reasons why the use of PFAS chemicals must be eliminated from the many products that needlessly contain, contain them. Through her pain and exhaustion, Amara was willing to be a voice of those who have become the victims of illnesses that are linked to these forever chemicals. Amara called on the lawmakers of Minnesota to do what is right in passing laws that will not only protect our environment and human lives, but also force industries to find alternative ways of manufacturing their products without these deadly chemicals. The Minnesota legislators did not back down from the onslaught of lobbying from corporations whose products are laced with these chemicals. The representatives and senators of Minnesota responded with prudence, virtue, and integrity by passing laws that will now lead the world in greatly reducing PFAS chemicals. As you may know, Amara died on April 14th, two days before her 21st birthday, and three days before the vote in the House. Amara wanted to do whatever she could, whatever strength she could call up, whatever needed to be said, to make her community a safe place to live. Amara was willing to do whatever it takes to prevent other young people from having to face a disease like her own. In a song she wrote, quote, you can try to tear me down, but no, my words will never die, end quote. Thank you, representatives and senators of Minnesota. Because of the noble work you have done in passing these laws to greatly limit PFAS chemicals, Amara's words will never die, and countless lives in Minnesota will be saved. Good morning. My name is Nora Strandy. I am Amara's younger sister. I am proud of the work Amara set in motion and thankful of the community of young people that Amara has created. I am proud of her friends who attended committee meetings, who rallied at the Capitol and worked to make their voices heard. I am grateful for the Minnesota legislators for allowing my family's story to be heard through the many stages of the legislative process. My family would like to thank the hard work of the House and the Senate members. We would especially like to thank Ivana Stark and Clearwater Action for the hard work and care that happened behind the scenes. The laws restricting PFAS chemicals are a good foundation. They will allow Minnesota to be proactive against the chemicals here that are harming our environment and the people of Minnesota. As my father said at this podium four months ago, 
These laws are a good beginning, but we must remember it is only the beginning. I now hand it over to Senator Seeberger. Good morning, I'm Senator Judy Seberger. Um, this issue is important to me, and I am honored to join the fight uh, begun by the Strandies to ensure that these forever chemicals are uh, once and for all banned here in Minnesota. They originated here, and I believe we have a duty to um, lead the charge in their eradication from the environment, from our bodies, from our um, consumer products, from our water. Um, these things are, as we're learning, they're everywhere. When I picked up this legislation, my focus was on uh, clean water. All up and down my district, it's District 41, from Grant in the north through Lake Elmo, Aft in the Lakeland Cities, Cottage Grove, Hastings. We have PFAS, and we're dealing with PFAS. My own well in my home is contaminated with PFAS. I have the big filters, so this, this is something that is personal to me and my family. Um, but as I started working on this legislation, it became clear to me just how many products PFAS was in, from our dental floss to our cookware to um, carpeting, upholstery, uh, consumer products that we use every day, firefighting foam that allows the introduction of these chemicals into our environment. Um, and it really became work that had a greater importance beyond my family, my district, uh, but to all people in Minnesota. I heard Amara's testimony during committee. I saw her bravely attend committee time after time to tell her story. And her family continues her work. And I'm honored, again, to be in this fight with them. And I will stay in this fight. Um, we have some of the, the toughest uh, PFAS laws in the nation now poised and ready to be enacted. And um, I have only just begun. I will continue this fight. It is a beginning and I will continue this work. Thank you. Hello, um, good afternoon. I'm State Senator Jen McEwen. I represent Duluth in the Minnesota State Senate. Um, it is truly an honor to be here today um, alongside Amar's family and, um, and all of the advocates and fellow legislators who have been working on this issue. Um, trying to make sure that PFAS is banned uh, effectively going forward except for essential uses and um, also uh, turning our attention to what we do now with the mess that we have, um, all of the PFAS that is out in our environment currently. I was just having a discussion about this the other day in regard to landfills and leachate. It's going to be a problem that we deal with for a long time. Um, so this is um, just a beginning, but it is... Um, a remarkable beginning. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, how disappointing it was and has been and is to see um, corporate power be brought to bear um, at the Capitol um, and with legislators and lobbyists um, who work here in our state um, brought to bear in a very intimidating and aggressive way to fight the work that we're doing and to try to get us to backtrack on this legislation. I am so grateful um, to Amar's family for making sure to hold all of us, all of us accountable. And I'm so grateful to my colleagues who refused to make any compromises that weren't reasonable, that would simply be a acquiescence to corporate power. Um, and stood strong so that we could pass this legislation and have this great legislation that is poised to be signed into law. So I'm very grateful to all of you. Thank you so much for standing strong on this. Um, I, I also just want to say, um, I, I, I wanted to make an announcement today. Um, I'm very proud of of our staff um, at, the, at the Senate and in the House, um, all of us saw the testimony that Amara brought to the legislature and all of us were so moved by um, what she was doing to advocate for all the rest of us when she was going through her own um, cancer and uh, was getting sicker and sicker and she kept coming and she kept sharing her story. It was amazing. And it moved so many people and um, my legislative assistant, Jack Fisher, um, 
was so moved as to one day come up with this beautiful idea that we should name this legislation after Amara. And he began one of the days when we were hearing the legislation and working on it to begin drafting a resolution. Um, and I am proud to say um, that as a result of his work and the result of, of all of our work together, that we um, are going to introduce a resolution in the Minnesota Senate and the Minnesota House um, to honor the activism and dedication of Amara Strandy, um, who, as we have heard, spoke um, at each of these hearings on the PFAS uh, issue, sharing her, the intimate details of her experience with PFAS and her uh, cancer. And um, we will be enacting the laws this year, and they will be known as Amara's Law. Um, so when we have that final draft, we will make sure to share that. It's in, it's in process right now, but we'll be, we'll be adopting that this session. So um, with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to um, Representative, after you. <laughs> Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Representative Matt Norris. I represent Blaine and Lexington in the Minnesota House of Representatives, and I, I want to begin by thanking the Strandy family for joining us this morning and for continuing Amara's courageous advocacy on this issue. Uh, because of you, countless Minnesotans' lives are going to be saved, and one group in particular that is going to benefit especially from this courageous advocacy is our firefighters. Uh, PFOS has been contained in firefighting foam for a, a long, long time. And I'm proud to be the chief author in the House of Representatives of the bill that will eliminate the use of PFOS in firefighting foam. Uh, we're going to do it in a responsible manner, in a way that protects public safety, while setting us on a course of making sure that we eliminate these cancer-causing chemicals and that we're not using PFOS in firefighting foam one day longer than absolutely necessary to maintain public safety. So uh, upon enactment of this legislation, uh, PFAS will be prohibited in most firefighting foam and in most uh, cases. We did carve out a few exceptions for airports and for oil refineries because of the unique nature of the fires that can occur in those spaces. And, and said what we did in those particular situations is we set up a pathway, uh, uh, basically an off-ramp to the use of PFAS so that we can account for the evolving science, uh, the, the supply chain constraints that sometimes exist, uh, but again, making sure that we're moving as rapidly as possible toward the elimination of PFAS uh, in those circumstances as well. And, and we actually saw just last night the FAA released their guidance on how airports can begin eliminating the use of PFAS at airports, Department of Defense facilities across the, the country and, and really across the world. And that's really the first step in the, the checklist that we created for airports to make sure uh, that, again, we're moving as rapidly as possible toward the elimination of PFAS at, uh, in our firefighting foam. We also know that it's in the turnout gear that our firefighters are wearing. Uh, and unlike the firefighting foam where we've got some good substitutes that are available, we just need to bring them to the marketplace and we need to get them deployed. Um, we, we haven't reached that stage with the turnout gear for our firefighters. And so uh, one of the other things that this legislation does is it commissions a report uh, by the uh, Minnesota Department of Pollution Control uh, as well as the Minnesota Department of Health uh, to look at how can we begin that process of a similar transition for the turnout gear for our firefighters and also establishes a voluntary biomonitoring system or, or database where our firefighters, if they choose, they can sign up to get biomonitoring so that uh, if they do suffer health effects from exposure to PFOS because of their work, uh, that we can catch it early and, and hopefully get them the treatment that they need uh, so that, again, we're saving as many lives as possible in making sure that our, our firefighting heroes uh, don't succumb to these deadly forever chemicals. And I, uh, with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Representative Brand. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jeff Brand. I represent District 18A, so that's Mankato North, Mankato, St. Peter, and a number of rural communities in the southern part of Minnesota. 
Um, you know, when I think about this legislation, when we think about what we were able to accomplish this year, it all centers around Amara and Amara's family. Um, uh, Representative Norris and I were able to attend Amara's funeral a couple of weeks ago, and there was a packed room full of people who were really greatly impacted um, by knowing Amara. And um, um, there were a lot of people who were really tuned in to her story, her, her challenges, but also her advocacy. And I think it was really important to note that even the, the, the clergy they were there men made mention of it. And so it's really important that we're moving closer to the finish line, but we're also highlighting Amara's accomplishments by naming the legislation after her. So I really do appreciate that. What the bill does, so in the legislature, uh, we are going to have a non-essential use ban of PFAS in Minnesota. We're going to give the... Uh, the MPCA, the authority to determine what an essential use is of PFAS in a product across the state. But also, we are going to prohibit certain things from having PFAS um, for sale or distribution starting on January 1st, 2025. That includes carpet and, and rugs, cleaning products, cookware, cosmetics, dental floss, yes, dental floss, fabric treatments, juvenile products, menstruation products, textile furnishings, ski wax, and upholstered, upholstered furniture. And you know, I think that it's really important to note that this piece of legislation, when it passes and is signed by the governor, will be a big um, new day for Minnesota. It will be a legacy for clean water in the state of Minnesota, but also for public health, public safety as well. Um, you know, I think the next steps in this policy, once we are next in this arena, uh, once we pass the, uh, the House File 1000 or the, or the, the full um, omnibus bill for the Energy and Environment Bill, next is uh, we have to have discussions about cleanup. And the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency already put together a blueprint for what that remediation and cleanup looks like. Um, they're right now doing some estimates on how much the cost will be. Um, I really do hope the state of Minnesota is collecting receipts because that should not be the taxpayer's responsibility to pay for that. That should ultimately be the people who have profited in the number of billions of dollars at the expense of um, both uh, public health but also um, uh, threats to our environmental legacy as well. And I know that we've also got a piece of legislation I'm working on with uh, Senator Tujang uh, for medical monitoring. That will be a great conversation for next year as a next step. Bottom line is PFAS doesn't really care if you're a Democrat or Republican, so I really appreciate the fact that we've got bipartisanship behind me today, and we've had bipartisanship in the House and the Senate as well. I think that's really important because I think that that's what the people across the state really want in situations like this. The last thing I will say is this legislation effectively will turn off the tap. And I think that that's important because if you're a county or a city, that's a cost. If you look at the, the number of landfills in the state that are leaching PFAS leachate into the groundwater surrounding those landfills, that's a cost. We have to turn off this tap before we can legitimately talk about that remediation and cleanup. So I'm really happy that we're getting closer to the finish line on this legislation, but all the folks behind me and all the people that are watching at home, we need to do the, the next steps, which is remediation and cleanup. So thank you very much. And then uh, next, I will introduce Representative Sidney Jordan. Um, thank you, everyone, and I'll be brief. Um, I am, my name is Sydney Jordan. I serve uh, the people of 60A, which is Northeast Minneapolis and Southeast Como in the Minnesota House of Representatives. Um, and uh, what Representative Brand said is right. With the adoption of this um, conference committee report that uh, we'll, we will hopefully be wrapping up soon, but we've already adopted these PFAS standards, this will be the strongest PFAS legislation in the nation. And that is significant because it was also unanimously agreed to in our conference committee by all House and Senate conferees, both Democrats and Republicans. And so to get there, um, it, it took a lot of work. And so I want to especially thank the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency and all of their staff. I want to thank Chair Herr um, and particularly my partner in justice, Senator McEwen, um, and all of the Senate staff. And I would also like to thank Chair Hansen um, and all of our House staff and all of our House and Senate authors who made this happen. Uh, this is very much a team effort. This has been something where uh, many, many, many hands uh, made this happen. Um, but especially, I, I do also want to echo the thanks to Amara Strandy and the entire Strandy family. Um, thank you to all of Amara's friends, and thank you to the entire Tartan High community. Um, for me, sitting in these, um, in, I serve as the vice chair of the Environment and Natural Resources Committee in the House. And we heard, and I've served on that committee in various capacities for several years, and to hear year after year children 
come and beg adult lawmakers to take action on this PFAS issue and for us to not do anything is heartbreaking. But this year we've done it. Your voices mattered. Amara's voice mattered and will save lives. Um, Minnesota invented PFAS. By passing this, Minnesota is going to invent the solution and end this um, harm caused by forever chemicals. And so I don't know if there's anyone else who would like to speak, but I think um, we can take just a few questions. Unfortunately, we are extremely pressed for time on the floor today, but I don't know if there's anyone else who has more to say. It looks like um, Andrea is perhaps going to give a few words, but then we can take questions. Thank you, Representative Jordan. Uh, my name is Andrea, <coughs> Andrea Lovell. I am the Legislative Director at Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy. Uh, throughout the session, I've been working very closely uh, with Ivana Stark at Clean Water Action and uh, all of the representatives that you see up here today. Um, and I am just awed by being part of this experience here in Minnesota. Uh, I think that a, a lot of us in this room maybe don't even know the full effect of, of what this is going to do, the ripple effect that this is going to take place. Um, I had a conversation uh, early on in, in my advocacy uh, with a former employee at 3M um, who said, you know, PFAS is this amazing thing because every molecule that you find around the world came from a lab in Minnesota. And I think about that all of the time when you find a molecule of PFAS in someone's blood in Norway or when you find it shoring up, um, you know, in in garbage on Madagascar Island, right? Like it's, when you find PFAS in all these places, it was developed in a lab here. And, um, you know, we've collectively, as Minnesotans said, like, enough is enough. And uh, we want to be part of the solution to this problem that started here. Um, and this is the exact kind of thing that got me into the space of advocacy because policy is personal. And I think that nobody said that message louder and clearer than Amara Strandy, um, that these policies matter. They affect people's lives, literally. And um, I am so incredibly grateful that Amara dedicated so much of her time at the end of her life to make sure that she made a difference on what matters. Um, so thanks, everybody. Uh, we're happy to answer some questions. Oh, April, I'm so sorry. Stand by me. Stand by me. <laughs> Briefly, said the senator. Um, some things are right, some things are simply wrong. Amara was right, and may God bless her legacy. Thank you. Questions from anybody? You guys talked about the bipartisan support for this um, in conference committee and in the House hearings and Senate hearings. Why did it take so long then to, to do this, um, you know, even in a divided legislature, if you had Republican and Democrat buy-in, why did it take this year to do it? So I will say that the House has, for years and years, passed legislation that would be bold. I know there are many people in this room that have carried authors, but we've seen that um, we have had a difficult time in the past actually agreeing to and passing legislation, even ones that are a good idea. This year, I am grateful that we can move forward um, and, and work together to pass this. I think um, by in, in the conference committee process, by um, maybe pulling PFAS out, um, where Senator McEwen and I talked to our, our colleagues, we were able to get that agreement, but it will be part of the broader environmental package. But it is something that um, it, it has taken far too long. It's something that we can do. We can't go back in time and pass legislation, but we can pass this legislation now and make sure that we pass a strong bill out of our conference committee that has both senators and representatives and Democrats and Republicans in it. And I don't know if there are others who would like to talk. Well, yeah, and so uh, it, there's a, a word that'll make you grieve, but in a word, Amara. Amara. Is our pesticides on any of the list that are uh, going to be immediately banned or restricted? Yeah, so I can uh, kind of tackle that question. Um, there is um, was a was an amendment in the ag committee um, that sort of uh, raises some questions about the specific question of of pesticides specifically and who will have the authority to determine whether or not it's an essential use. Um, but we're not really concerned about uh, that in the overall effect of the bill. Um, we think that uh, it, we have still seen dedication and commitment from agencies across the board uh, to tackle this PFAS problem. 
problem. And it just might mean that there may be some more conversations on some specific chemicals. You have talked about the um, cleanup to try to clean up the existing PFAS that's in the environment. Is it, there's money in this bill for some of those programs, correct? And can you speak to that investment um, and its goals? There was money agreed to um, earlier today in our um, global environment offer about PFAS source reduction grants at the amount of $4,420,000. So that was part of another agreement today that will also be part of the broader um, agreement. But I think there's much more than we can do. We know that we need more than uh, just over $4 million to address the scope of this problem. But there are um, PFAS source reduction grants available as part of this package that were agreed to in a bipartisan fashion this morning as well. Is that for local governments or? Um, it is through the, um, it's through Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Don't they have a bunch more money in a separate bill? for that stuff? Um, there might be. I don't have that number right in front of me. I just have the number on PFAS. That was earlier today. I don't know. Perhaps Chair Her could speak more to what is in other uh, parts of the broader bill. Yeah, so uh, thank you for that question. Uh, there, there are money in, in many many areas. You know, PFAS is all over the place. and. Their money in, in, in the PFAS in, in terms of uh, c containing landfill as well. So, um, you know, that's, that's just one example, but there are uh, PFAS dollars, you know, uh, appropriate in, in, in many parts of the environment, in mm -hmm. environmental bill. Can anyone speak to what um, was mentioned earlier about the intimidation and aggressiveness of the opponents? Can someone be more specific about what happened? that maybe went through it? <laughs> um, I'll start, and then I think that maybe by opening the door, other people will feel more comfortable. I will tell you that people flew in from other states to intimidate us. Um, I question whether or not some folks actually were legally or illegally lobbying in the state of Minnesota on behalf of this specific issue, and it'll be a question for the Campaign Finance Board going forward, and possibly some reforms. But I will tell you that there have been first, I've heard first-hand accounts of physical intimidation by members outside of, of um, you know, the, in the lobbying sphere on this specific issue. Also, um, you know, the sky's always falling till it's not, right? So uh, we heard story after story after story, and people kept coming up to my office and to my legislative assistant and to me as well in the hallway, talking about how the sky was falling um, and testimony in the, in the committees, talking about how things were not going to, were not going to be sold in Minnesota. Products were just simply not going to be sold in Minnesota. I will tell you that they will be sold in Minnesota because they'll be missing out on a large market, and they'll figure it out, right? Give them a problem, and people will figure out the solution. And so, you know, I think the biggest thing is, yes, there has been intimidation in this, in this capital on this specific issue. It's something we have to address because it has to be a safe place for us to not only to talk about the democratic process, but also to legitimately have ideas and work through those ideas in this process that we have. We can't do that effectively when people are feeling unsafe here. That's, how, that's my uh, opinion on it, as I see it. I kind of want to speak on the other side of that uh, and say that uh, instead of talking about the fear that is associated with that, talk about the courage um, that we've had in response to that. Um, I think that a lot of the people coming from out of town uh, really underestimated a group of moms. Um, and I think that once they sat at the table with us, they got scared and uh, tried to do um, tactics that are less than palatable. And so I think what we're really seeing is a sign of strength here in Minnesota um, that you don't mess with moms here. And um, I really believe that uh, they showed a last gasping effort of that type of tactic here in Minnesota politically. Is there, are there any tests that uh, Amara's family can take to see if they have symptoms or, because I assume you all had the same exposure. One of the pieces of legislation that Representative Brain mentioned earlier was around medical monitoring, and that will make it easier for individuals who have been or feel that they have been exposed to PFAS to work with their doctors to receive that monitoring so that it doesn't bankrupt them. Um, and so that if there is unfortunately any illness that is starting to um, begin, that that is caught early. Um, I will let the Serenity speak to what they are engaging in. Thank you so much. 
So um, post-mortem, Amara was tested for PFOS, um, and we are still um, awaiting some results for that um, to see whether, to see which chemicals in her blood um, are in her blood and how that matches to the chemicals in our area. Um, and I, at, so at this moment, there is no plan for our, the other, other of us to get tested, but um, we are awaiting a test back for Amara. And so the, the, the bill is, is in conference committee. It's not been voted on by the conference committee yet though, right? But you've, they've agreed that this will remain intact. It's been adopted. Yeah. It's been adopted. Well, um, yes, I'm, I'm State Senator Fonghor. I just jump in and answer your question earlier, but you know, forgot to introduce myself. I'm State Senator Fonghor. I represent East High St. Paul. And I'm, I'm the chair um, in, in Energy, Environment, and Legacy. Uh, Legacy. And yes, yeah, so we did ad adapt the PFAS. Uh, provision into our larger omnibus bill. Now it's called the Amara Strandy Law uh, in, 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 in the bill itself. And so uh, we're looking at maybe a day or two uh, to pass a bill out of committee and it will go to the floor for both sides of the Senate and the House to pass and send it to the governor. Thank you. Someone help me just get the subtlety right here. Did Amara believe that uh, PFAS caused her cancer or suspect or help me with that? Amar believed that PFAFs, <clears throat> PFAFs um, were a part of the cause of her cancer. In talking with um, a researcher that has, we have been working with for a while from Rockefeller about um, how if your DNA is vulnerable at any given point, which none of us know when that is, and it interacts with a toxin, um, a cell mutates and then that cell mutates, causing the next cells to mutate, causing cancer. So we know that it was a toxin. We are also working with um, someone from um, Notre Dame with once we get the results, the very specific results, um, we will be able to see if there is correlation with the chemical in chemicals in our particular area. I know that we can walk up and down our street that we lived on, um, we recently moved, um, for so many people in our neighborhood who have cancer or other illness. It is hard, I have to say, to be so open about something that is so private about my children's health and what that means as a mother, that I raised them in that neighborhood, it's very personal. And it's hard to be asked if she was tested and if we will be tested. And it just feels like a little too much prying. But as a mother, I will do all I can to protect my family with information I have now that I wish I'd had when they were little. And I will do all I can to protect mothers from the pain and the despair that I experience in the loss of Amara. Of course, I'm, what mother wouldn't be concerned about their other child or about their husband? I appreciate, on one hand, that question being asked. On another, it's like, we really have asked a question right out of the core of my being as the mother in this family. Thank you. From a scientific perspective, um, I can address a little bit of the research that is behind um, some of this as well, which is that specific uh, types of cancer have been linked to PFAS exposure, um, and that is cancer of the liver uh, as well as brain tumors. Um, and so with the particular type of cancer that Amara had, uh, I mean, from a scientific standpoint, um, it's not a leap. I just want to add, too, um, that if you haven't listened to Amara's testimony, if you haven't actually watched it, 
I highly encourage you to go back and just, just listen to it. Um, I, I recall that part of what I heard from her testimony, of course, part of it was her cancer and, and the struggle of living with cancer um, and, and all that that entails and dying from cancer. Um, but a large part of her testimony had to do with um, so the pain and trauma of the entire experience of growing up in a community where she and her family and her friends were exposed to these poisons repeatedly. That break of trust that happens, part of that, that was part of the most heartbreaking part for me. We're all in community together, and we're supposed to be taking care of one another. We're supposed to make sure that something like this doesn't happen to people. So that break of trust for me was one of the most impactful parts of her testimony to realize what that meant for her and her family, not just in, in terms of what she was living through at that moment that she was going to die and she knew that, but just thinking back on all of her friends and family and neighbors and wondering what this meant for all of them and for all of us as a community. Are there any, we have time for one more question. Are there any other questions? Well, thank you for coming and, and hearing the Strandy story throughout these last few months. I appreciate it.